I'm Sarah Backhouse for Hub Culture and I'm now joined by the former Prime Minister of Great Britain and an ongoing advocate for the environment, Tony Blair. Welcome Mr Blair. Thank you. The UK has managed to cut its carbon to Kyoto uh, targets and yet increase its incidence of green jobs. Is this something that can be replicated by the rest of the world? Yes, I think so. I mean, the truth is it is possible to create jobs through clean technology and the development of, of more sustainable ways of growth. And, and actually, even though people, when we first started taking measures um, on the economy, said, well, you're going to damage the competitiveness of the country, it's not what's happened. What do we need to do uh, to ensure success in Copenhagen? Well, I think personally, we, we've got to get practical. This is the moment to get practical. I mean, Copenhagen, the, the global agreement for climate change um, has got to really provide us with a solution this time. And the way of doing that, I think, is, is to make for practical programs, for example, on deforestation. That is 15 to 20 percent of the climate problem. Right? We need a practical problem to deal with that, to halt deforestation and then over time uh, reverse it. Now, it's practical programs that I think are the key to this. Otherwise, we will continue to have a situation where people say, yes, it's a huge issue, we agree with it, yeah, but what do we do? And we've got to answer the how, really. That's, that's the question we've got to answer. You mentioned another interesting thing in your speech earlier uh, today. Uh, 2050 is often the date that's the timeline, but really that seems like it's a very long time. What is the date that should be set for these targets? You need an interim date. Now, it, most people talk about 2020, could push back a little bit if that's a matter for negotiation. But you need, you, you can't just say, look, you know, this is not a problem that you can wake up in 2042 and start to, to get to grips with in order to get the size of reduction that we need. Because you're talking about, over time, literally changing the nature of your economy to a low carbon economy. Now, I believe that is perfectly possible to do, incidentally. But you need that incentive put into the system now, and that's why you need the interim target. You need, people need to know that actually we're aiming for the next 10 years as well as the next 40 or 50. And how do you balance? I mean, governments inherently have short-term goals, and yet you have this long-term vision. How do the two marry? I think by making sure that, as it were, nobody comes into this arrangement seeking to multiply a competitive advantage by having other people take action and them escaping from responsibility. So this will only ever work, this deal, if America and China, to put it quite bluntly, um, you know, Europe and India are on the same page. Now, what about a price on target, um, on carbon rather? Thomas Friedman mentioned this in his keynote address. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole purpose of things like the cap and trade system is not that it, actually in the short term it will not deliver um, a huge amount, but in the longer term, as you change the system and learn about how carbon markets work, the important thing that it, is that it, it puts a price on, on carbon and therefore it incentivizes business and industry to develop the science and technology. I mean, the solutions to this will be some things that you and I kind of know about today but maybe haven't been de developed commercially. There may be things that we've never even heard of. But the moment it is clear that that is where there is, you know, business to be created, opportunities, um, you know, possibilities of creating real value, uh, and that requires a price on carbon. The moment that happens, that then you, you'll start to find this whole development of the science and technology accelerate. The fact that countries are at different stages of development, will that make forming an agreement challenging? Yeah, this is the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, I mean, put it very simply, if America did everything that the environmental campaigners wanted it to do, but China did nothing, you'd have the same problem. What do we do to get over those challenges? Well, what you've therefore got to do is China's at a different stage of development, so you can't expect the same types of commitment from China now. They've got to industrialize, um, but you can expect that they will do what it is reasonable to ask them to do. So, for example, the Chinese leadership have come out recently with a, a, a set of really quite ambitious targets, actually, for China, um, including peaking their emissions in 2030, which is a big thing for a developing country to do. So the other thing we need to do is for the poorest countries, when they are trying to, to, to grow but do it sustainably, you know, we're going to have to share the technology with them and help them implement it. You're working on a number of initiatives. There's one called uh, Cutting the Cost, a report that mm -hmm. came out from you. Uh, can you briefly describe what the findings were? Yeah, very simply what we did was, was show that actually when you invest in clean technology, 
uh, it does have a payback in terms of jobs, um, in terms of growth. And what's more, and this is another reason for dealing with this issue, if the price of oil starts to rise back up to where it was, you know, before $100 a barrel or, or something, then actually th this clean energy is, is, I mean, it's a cost saver, not, not, a, not, not um, something that costs you money. So I in the end, look, you know, some of all of these things are very um, debatable, all these propositions about cost. But I am absolutely sure myself that once you get the thing underway so that people know there is a clear direction towards a low car carbon future, you know, you will find massive job opportunities in, in solar and just in things like energy efficiency in building the appliances that are going to allow us to consume less energy. And finally, we're here at the Governor's Global Climate Summit. Are you encouraged by the power of sub-national governments to yield power? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, one big thing that I've been involved with now over a few years is that if you get states and cities acting, that is, I mean, in the end, that, that, that's what the thing's about. They're going to have to do it. And I think what Governor Schwarzenegger has done here in California is fantastic. You know, this was a brave thing to do a few years ago. Now, um, he's added a lot of support to that, but, but it's, um, no, it's been a, a big breakthrough. And a lot of what we're asking people to do is going inevitably to require the support and active work of states and, and, and sub-regions. Mr. Blair, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thanks. Thanks.